I've always been highly intrigued by the small luxury sports sedan segment. It's the car that can do everything, from Costco runs to canyon carving, from cross-country road trips to outpacing actual sports cars at track days. But this type of vehicle's all-around in nature also necessitates a high degree of compromise, and for that reason, I've admittedly become very, very picky when reviewing them. Though I've experienced many generations of BMW M3, various AMGs, fast Audis, and Cadillacs, only one car, a modified 2011 M3, has cracked into the top 20 of my Zygreen Performance Index. So let's find out if the Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio, the Italian manufacturer's first modern attempt in this segment, can trade blows with or even outgun the best from Germany and the USA. This, of course, is the 2017 Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio. I'm here with its owner, and he's going to say a few things about the car. So why did you choose this car over the tried-and-true sports sedans like the M3 or the C63? Actually, it was just, I didn't even compare to the shop. I, it's a car that I've known since I was a kid, and uh, my grandfather drove the car, and I just wanted this car. It's a car that appealed to me. All the other cars were just somehow not on my radar, not on my books, and I didn't even shop, I just bought this car. So your grandfather had the original the Alba Julia, Julia. The 1971 Julia Super. Yeah, those yeah. things are absolutely beautiful. I right. saw one in Italy a couple years back, and it was one of the most beautiful. I actually took a picture because it was just so eye-catching. And I think this car actually, the first time I saw it when I drove up to it, I was like, wow, that's a really, really beautiful car. I think it looks good from every angle. It's not just the front or the rear. I mean, the whole thing looks like it was designed cohesively. Right, right. I totally forgot about the Alfa Romeo while I was uh, in my middle ages, uh, raising a family and career. I just okay. didn't think much about cars until I got older. Alfa generally wasn't in the mind of performance car enthusiasts until more recently. You know, they came out with a 4C, Right. then the Giulia, um, I think the Giulietta is available in, in Europe, yeah. Europe, which is a pretty fun hot hatch. Right. But yeah, they're really trying to make a statement nowadays, um, competing with some of the big German manufacturers. Right. Alpha left the U.S. in 1994, I believe. They had uh, emission issues, uh, reliability problems. Uh, it wasn't until the 4C came out in what, 2013? Uh -huh. And this car came out in 16, but it wasn't available until 17 in the U.S. Okay. So I think for, for depending on when you were born for a generation, they don't know about Alfa Romeo. Although Alfa Romeo is a lot older and has a greater heritage than BMW. Right, think, right. Uh, it's, what, 1901? It was, or 1911 was this founding? Wow, so yeah. over 100 years yeah. old. And you mentioned that Enzo Ferrari actually and used he was, to work. He's one of the drivers. Uh, on the quarterfolio Clover Leaf, he's one of the four uh, drivers on it. Got it. Uh, so he was part of uh, Alfa Romeo until 19, I don't know, 50. He got frustrated, set up his own company. Okay, okay. Yeah. But they're all in one big family, you know, Maseratis, Alfa Big Romeo's, Italian yeah, family. <laughs> We're in dynamic mode, but we've got the damper set to soft. Um, the car is very, very supple. I will say that the tires are very loud. They pick up all the little rocks, um, the pebbles flying up into the wheel well. And these are, of course, the Pirelli P0 Trofeo tire, or tr uh, Corsa, Corsa tires, Corsa, excuse Corsa. me. Yeah. Um, a 60 treadwear tire, that's which right. is, that's, right. the, that's the most insane that's treadwear crazy. rating of any production street car I've ever seen. So a few specs about the car. Um, it weighs around 3,700 pounds, about typical for this class of sedan. They took the 3.9 liter V8 from the Ferrari 488 GTB and the California T, and they basically cut off two of the cylinders. So instead of a 3.9 V8, you got a 2.9 V6. Still twin turbo, it makes 505 horsepower and almost 450 foot-pounds of torque. So, I mean, if you do the math, that's 80 horsepower more than the F80 M3. It's about 40 horsepower more than the Cadillac, Cadillac ATS-V. And it's right up there with the Mercedes C63 S. Let's take a look at the interior real quick. You know, my favorite thing about the interior is the steering wheel. It just has such a, I don't want to say aftermarket look to it, because it is very well integrated with the rest of the interior, but it, this stands out. It's got a presence, right? It's got a presence yeah. to it, yeah. And I actually really like that the rim is actually quite thin. A lot of times with the BMWs, you get a really thick rim steering wheel. It just makes it a little bit harder to maneuver. The start button on the steering wheel, very, very Italian, very Ferrari. Very Ferrari like, yeah. I love that. <laughs> I think it's designed very well. It's, it flows very well. But some of the material qualities are 
Basically, average, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's mainly the, the panels on the side door. Yeah, yeah the, these the bottom the bottom panels are for plastic. Yeah, otherwise it's Italian leather and Alcantara. Yeah. The leather is nice. Yeah. yeah, I think the design very much reminds me of like um, like a Mazda. <laughs> that true. true. That's what I've heard. This is interesting because it gives you this big expanse, but is the screen only limited to this port portion? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's one of the okay. biggest complaints. It's and it's not touchscreen, is it? No, it's not. The uh, 2020 models is. Oh, okay. Uh, not not this one. Oh. Yeah, that looks like a 2005 It's uh, one of the generations behind the Germans. Got it, yeah. got it. Yeah. So, okay, we're in soft damper mode. So how do we you switch just that? Just hit this once. Damper yeah. mode, okay. So stiff. This is stiff? Yeah. So it's either soft or yeah. stiff. Right. Okay. <laughs> the gear ratios are very short. Turn-in is so sharp, wow. Okay, <laughs> now I see what we're playing with. <laughs> the, this engine and transmission combo is, is, is ideal for this car. I'm actually, I'm glad I'm not having to mess with a manual. The way this engine is kind of designed, it's, it's, it's all about the top end, right? You've got a red line of almost 7,000. Right, right. And with those twin turbos, I think this thing's pushing like 35 pounds of boost. All the power is between four and seven. And so what that means is you need a lot of gears. So eight speed gears are spaced very close together. So you're always in the power band. You know, I tried to give it be aggressive on the throttle coming out of corners and right. it, the traction control was just like holding me back a little bit. Oh, you know what? In race mode, you lose that. It's all manual. You lose that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that might be a little more fun. Even with the dampers in the hard mode, it's still supple. A lot of manufacturers take the hard damper mode way too far. Worse, the Fender, the Ford Focus RS, the 2016 or 17 that I drove, in hard mode, the car is completely undrivable on a road like this. Oh, wow. It's just pogo sticking everywhere. I think that's one of the good things about this car is that it can also be a daily driver if you want. Right. That's a critical point for cars in this segment, like the M3, ATSV, the C63. They all have to be daily driver friendly. I mean, Yes, you can take these cars out on the track, but 99.9% .9 of the time, you're driving it on the road. Correct. And I think this car is quite a bit more comfortable than the M4 I drove. The M4 with the adaptive dampers, even in soft mode, is quite a bit firmer and more harsh. In terms of driving dynamics, this car reminds me more of the ATS-V, believe it or not. Yeah. Really playful chassis, quick steering. The only place where this absolutely murders the ATS-V is the transmission. The ATS-V uses also a conventional torque converter automatic, but I think it's like just a GM unit, and it's very, very slow to shift. You can put it into race unit. How do you do that? Just all the way. Okay. Oh, okay. It's going to stiff cool. suspension mode. Got it. Yeah. Wow, this throttle becomes so sensitive in race mode. almost too sensitive for my like I, if I find that I can't modulate it as well. Did the exhaust just become louder yeah, too? It's very loud. <laughs> I was gonna say it seems yeah. louder now. It's very loud in race mode, yeah. You know what low RPMs I'm not a huge fan of the way this engine sounds. Right. It's a little bit droney. Yeah it is. That's and also it lacks response. Correct. Yeah. The brakes are really really good at stopping the car. But there's almost no feedback through the pedal. It's a brake by wire. Right? Brake by wire, yeah, yeah. yeah. The steering is the same way. It's very quick, precise, but not a whole lot of feedback through the wheel. The car has a lot of traction. The rear end is no pro it has no problem handling 505 horsepower. With the ATS-V, you know, that car is a similar weight, maybe a little bit heavier than this, and has a similar amount of power, 467 horsepower or something. Is it a V8 on it? Uh, twin turbo V6. Oh, V6, yep. I didn't know that. Yep. Okay. All right. And uh, coming out of corners, that thing is just sideways around every corner. This one feels a lot more hunkered down. Could be the tires also. 
Amphibia tires, yes. The ATSV was just on uh, Michelin, I think Super Sports. <laughs> that straight line performance is honestly insane for a sedan. To be quite honest, this car is overtired for driving on a road like this. I can't get the back end to even unstick. <laughs> and yet it's the most powerful car in this class that I've ever driven. So go figure. In race mode, I wish the throttle and the brake pedal were not so sensitive. And I wish that was something you could adjust individually. I think you're right. That's a consensus among the drivers that that's the one advantage that BMW has over Alfa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the Italians, they do things their way. They do yeah. things their way, yeah. you either like it or you don't. Exactly. Right? Can you feel the difference in the, in the uh, throttle? Yeah, the throttle pedal immediately in natural mode is exactly how I want it. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. That initial like inch of travel, it right. feels kind of mushy, which is actually what I like. Okay. The position of the pedal goes from here to here. Right. I want the whole range to actually mean something. I don't want it to be artificially boosted to just the first 25%. It's the brake by wire, but if you had a conventional brake, I think you'd be a little more yeah, happier. Yeah. But once you get used to it, it's, it's, it works. So while the Giulia Quadrifoglio is by no means perfect, it's still a brutally fast sedan with a class-leading chassis and drool-worthy exterior. Its overly touchy inputs, lack of a customizable driving mode, and outdated infotainment system are legitimate gripes when stacked up against the competition. But the overall package is still a damn good effort from a manufacturer that hasn't been a serious player in the US for a long time. Here's hoping the next generation makes its way stateside, maybe even with a manual.